this right in natural yeah. language processing uh, with a focus on evaluation and interpreting neural networks uh, applied to natural language understanding and reading comprehension uh, so the, i think this is a very hot topic at the moment uh, his research interests include finding novel challenging tasks to clearly define and push the limits of the state of the art uh, and uh, natural language processing okay so bef before his, uh, his his current position in manchester he received um, uh, a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science degrees in computer science at the uh, University of Passau in Germany. Um, and he already applied uh, his natural language processing expertise in different domains, uh, such as structural engineering, software security, and nuclear safety. So I'm really, really curious what this presentation will be on. Uh, Victor, the, the floor is yours. Uh, I probably need to stop my my sharing on my side, so you can do the sharing. Just a second. All right. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Menno. Thanks everyone for uh, joining the talk, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, it's um, a great opportunity to talk a little bit about my research. Um, what happens if I just share screen now? Will it work? Ah, okay, I think I managed to stop my sharing. I was struggling with the interface a little bit. All right. So can you see my screen now? Yes, I can. All right, great. So um, uh, as introduced, I'm going to be talking about uh, neural natural language processing and its applications and uh, some um, open research questions. So typically going in a talk like that, I would uh, talk about uh, the research I've been doing uh, for the past couple of years. But um, given the scope of the uh, colloquium, I, uh, me and Mena, we thought uh, that it's uh, probably a little bit better to sort of um, start with an overview of uh, natural language processing and uh, what are some interesting applications that can be done with um, state-of-the-art natural language processing techniques. And then uh, I would uh, take a dive into um, so the research I've been doing, but uh, positioning it in, into the more, um, uh, into the larger context of um, what are sort of some of the research questions and issues arising of state-of-the-art natural language processing. So um, to start right off, and it's going to be a bit technical, but bear with me, please. So um, uh, traditionally natural language processing um, approaches were based on uh, rules and uh, feature-based approaches. So, and we will exercise this on an archetypal example of span detection, whereas um, uh, you get an email and you sort of need to decide whether that email is uh, interesting or uh, whether it's spam. So uh, for an input, uh, uh, which is uh, the email uh, piece of text, uh, you would operate um, uh, on a symbol level. Uh, so you would operate over the strings and then you would uh, sort of, uh, as a researcher, define a set of rules in the form of if uh, something appears, then do something and something. And then based on this uh, cascade of rules, you would arrive at the prediction whether um, the, your input email is a spam or not. Now, um, these uh, rules can be cascaded in form of a pipeline where we uh, sort of infer more and more linguistic information such as part of speech or named entities. And then uh, these are uh, used as additional input to uh, arrive at the decision. Or um, they, they, they can use some sort of uh, background information in form of uh, lexicon uh, uh, or, or um, dictionaries and perform some symbol level operations such as uh, regular expressions. Um, now, um, th these rules can be sort of uh, inferred from some um, a background corpus uh, by observing some regularities. And this can be also done uh, sort of automatically by extracting um, this linguistic information in form of uh, features. And then uh, on that background corpus, uh, um, uh, estimating the weight of those features. And now the features, they sort of uh, represent some linguistic information. So for example, the occurrence of uh, certain words or the length of the text or uh, uh, occurrence of some certain uh, part of speech um, uh, text. And uh, how do we know that uh, whatever we built uh, here, and we, uh, um, uh, I refer to we here as in general uh, natural language processing uh, researchers. So how do we know that the system that we built here um, sort of works? Well, we have a gold standard data set where we have a couple of labeled uh, emails with, uh, where someone went over and decided manually whether it's spam or not. And then we run our system automatically and uh, measure the accuracy, how well it sort of can predict 
whether um, an email is uh, spam or not. So that's how we establish the accuracy of the system. Now, uh, new to the picture are embedding-based approaches, which uh, differ uh, from, from the previously mentioned approaches in a way that uh, they take as input just, uh, just the words that appear in the, uh, in the text, and then they uh, sort of uh, um, uh, embed them in a high dimensional vector space to obtain a high uh, dimensional distributional representation. And then a different uh, module, which is uh, used to predict um, uh, the output probability of the class labels, in this case, uh, the, the probability of uh, the email being spam or not, is used to reason over this distributional representation. So um, both this uh, embeddings and this uh, prediction modules are again, um, uh, uh, trained uh, or optimized on a label data set where we have, again, someone going over a bunch of uh, emails and manually labeling them whether they are spam or not. And again, we establish the accuracy on a gold standard by uh, uh, measuring uh, how many of the manually labeled uh, emails are predicted correctly. So that's, that was a handful, let's, uh, or a mouthful. Let's see what's going on here. So what, 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 uh, what is a distributional representation or what do I mean by embedding? So uh, as uh, Goethe um, said with this very fancy and uh, uh, old English, well, he didn't say it in English because Goethe was German, but uh, if we translate this to uh, modern day uh, NLP relevant English, what that basically means, so the distributional hypothesis states that words that occur in similar contexts are similar. So what that means for us um, uh, as researchers this, uh, that, or as NLP uh, practitioners that we can take words and place them in a high dimensional vector space. And if we just close, uh, move words closer together that appear in similar contexts and we move words uh, further apart that do not appear in similar contexts. And how do we know that? Well, we um, estimate uh, this, uh, the words and their co-occurrence with their contexts uh, on some big corpus. And this is something that can be done uh, computationally. Uh, so it's an optimization problem. And then we get a picture like that. So uh, we, we get a vector space here. It's three dimensional in practice. It would be of course uh, a much higher dimensional where the, um, where the axis represents some sort of uh, uh, meanings that we can attribute to words. And the vectors uh, in that vector space uh, are sort of, um, they represent uh, the words in this uh, representation. So for example, if we have a vector space like this here, where this axis talks about something with wings and this axis talks about something with, um, with an engine, and this axis talks about that has to do with the sky, then we have on, on this axis, we would have vectors that sort of uh, represent words that have wings, so B and eagle, whereas on this axis, we would have a words that sort of represent something with an engine, so a rocket or drone. And the farther up they go, the more they have to do with the sky. So a helicopter would have to do more of a sky than a rocket because a rocket sort of probably has something more to do with space. Now we don't have to confine ourselves to the axis, of course. So something in between would then arguably have to do both with wings and with engine and with sky. So if we take a look at this, so a jet is something um, uh, a quarter times uh, B plus rocket, which is the sort of a funny uh, way to see it, especially uh, not sure what uh, a quarter of a B plus rocket uh, is supposed to be. But if you think about it, what that basically means is that a jet both um, has wings and an engine. So similarly uh, to uh, B and rocket. And uh, we can already make use of this uh, embeddings uh, just um, as they are to exploit the similarity in the, in the high dimensional vector space and similarity basically means low distance. So uh, uh, word vectors that are close apart. So if we reduce the dimensionality to something which we can actually perceive, so uh, for example, two dimensions here, we can uh, do some topic modeling. So for example, if we uh, embed um, uh, books here based on their genre or Wikipedia articles based, based on the category um, uh, uh, they belong to. And then we sort of uh, visualize uh, this embeddings and we can see that the categories in fact appear uh, closer to each other. So the, the words uh, do in fact uh, uh, get uh, positioned close in the uh, vector space based on uh, their topic similarity. And we can do use uh, this uh, to cluster um, a set of documents in a meaningful way, or we can, um, if we regard this as a sort of as a data set and we have um, um, a new document uh, which we want to see what, what are the 
uh, most similar documents uh, from our uh, data set. We can just embed it uh, in the same uh, vector space and then just retrieve the k nearest neighbors. For example, if we have a new document about machine learning, we would probably place it somewhere here and find uh, some of the most similar uh, documents about machine learning from Wikipedia based on the uh, content similarity. So now this is nothing particularly uh, special uh, and new to uh, neural networks. This can be done with uh, traditional techniques such as um, uh, a term frequency. It's just that if we learn these embeddings uh, with neural networks, uh, they appear to um, perform better. So. Uh, what is a neural network, uh, 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 talking about neural networks? So on a very abstract level and probably a very unhelpful level, but it helps to understand it, is um, it's, uh, it's something that takes a vector as input and multiplies it with a matrix and produces another vector. So uh, we take um, a vector, multiply it with a matrix, uh, apply some nonlinear activation fun function and uh, produce a, high, a higher dimensional hidden vector. And which we can take again um, as, as the input to the next matrix multiplication. If we repeat this a couple of times until we get to our output vector, which uh, for the spam example, would basically represent the um, probability of um, the email being spam or not. So how do we, um, get from uh, uh, numbers and vectors and embeddings and whatnot to actually a system that predicts whether or not uh, an email is spam is we take uh, the word as input, uh, that is the, the, the mail as input, and we embed the words uh, to obtain the distributional representation using, for example, word embeddings as we've seen before. And then we um, use a neural network to predict uh, the, the output, which is the probability of the um, uh, of, of the input uh, being spam or not. And uh, uh, initially it will be just some random prediction uh, because uh, the, the numbers here that we use are random. But what we can do is we can uh, calculate the error between uh, the pr prediction that we produced with this neural network and the prediction that we would have expected the neural network to produce because um, uh, we, we, um, uh, we have a label data set. So we know already uh, what the input for this, uh, what the label for this input is. And uh, because uh, neural networks are fully differentiable, so that, uh, what, what that means is we can attribute uh, uh, the whole error here to all the um, uh, weights in both in the embedding and in the prediction module. And what that means is we then, uh, we can then move the vectors um, uh, or the, the, the weights in such a way that uh, when we uh, encounter an input that is uh, similar to this one next time, the prediction is going to be somewhere closer to the actual truth. Um, and as it turns out, if we do that for enough examples, uh, what, what's going to happen is that uh, when we're done training it, uh, we can take this module, uh, so, so this, um, uh, uh, this neural networks here and apply them to similar input. And then we will get uh, predictions just based on the uh, on, on the words that appear in the input and uh, our optimized weights uh, for, from the embeddings and the prediction module. So that was, again, a mouthful. And I hope you didn't uh, doze off already because it was something that was highly abstract, uh, uh, um, uh, explaining something highly technical. But what that means uh, for us, basically, is that we can shift our focus to collecting uh, examples um, as input-output pairs. So for the uh, uh, running example, we just collect a couple of emails where we label them as spam or no spam. And then uh, we can uh, sort of use uh, existing software frameworks to perform all the computations which I was uh, talking about uh, before. So all these things, uh, they can be done automatically. So we don't need to uh, sort of worry about how we implement that. We can focus on uh, collecting the data. And as we have seen, so there was uh, nothing about, uh, I didn't mention anything about uh, sort of linguistic information or uh, rules or anything. So um, uh, neural networks learn to perform a task from minimal supervision. So you do not need to uh, encode the task specific knowledge into your approach as it was the case with rule-based approaches or uh, feature um, uh, extraction approaches. But instead you can learn to perform task, uh, uh, to perform the task just from uh, a lot of input and output examples assuming you have the data, of course, so there's always a catch. So um, looking at uh, natural language processing uh, from this angle, we can then uh, go ahead and look, so which tasks can we model uh, in this way? And similar to, um, similar to the, the spam classification example, 
Um, we can uh, look at other uh, document level classification tasks where the goal is to assign a, a fixed category to a, a given piece of text or multiple pieces of text. So for example, uh, decide whether two uh, sentences are a prior phrase or whether there's like some offensive uh, uh, language uh, in a piece of text. And I want uh, to uh, look at uh, four of the more interesting uh, tasks mentioned here, which is factor and sense verification, uh, uh, fact verification and sense detection, and sentiment uh, and emotion analysis and classification. So what's uh, fact verification? Uh, fact verification is the task of uh, deciding for a claim whether um, it's in fact uh, true and supported by some sort of evidence or whether it's uh, a fake news. So here in this example, we have a claim where uh, Rodney King writes to place in the most populous country of the USA. And uh, the system would need to retrieve the uh, corresponding um, articles from Wikipedia, which talk about the riots and also uh, the, the place where it took place, and it would need to um, infer from from uh, from, from this uh, given information, so from the claim and the background information, whether um, uh, uh, whether, whether this claim is true, which in fact is true because um, the Rodney King's riots took place in the Los Angeles County, which is the most populous, uh, populous county in the USA. So again, uh, this, this being the input uh, and one of the fixed classes would be either it's uh, true or uh, fake, or maybe there's not enough information to decide. So uh, similar but different is the uh, task of stance detection where um, for a given claim, uh, the, uh, the system will need to decide uh, whether um, a, a comment sort of supports that claim or denies that claim, or whether um, it is a, a sort of unrelated comment. So for example, here, we understand that there are two gunmen at, up uh, to a dozen hostages inside the cafe under siege at Sydney, uh, which is a claim uh, I assume extracted from uh, Twitter. Um, uh, the, the goal is to look through um, the comments in relation to that claim to, to decide whether it's the, the stance is sort of like supportive or uh, in denial. So for example, uh, this tweet here claims that, uh, that these are not ISIS flags, so um, uh, the system would need to infer that this is um, that this uh, tweet uh, denies um, uh, this tweet here. Um, on the other hand, uh, in talking about tweets, a sentiment analysis is the task of uh, classifying um, uh, the, the positive or negative uh, sentiment uh, uh, from, a, uh, from a piece of text. So for example, uh, the, this tweet here would be, um, it would need to be classified as negative, whereas um, uh, this tweet here uh, would be probably classified as positive because here someone wishes Happy Mother's Day. And here, someone is taking something, uh, talking is, uh, pretty badly about internet culture. So it's again the classes here that needs to be assigned would be somewhere on a scale from minus five to five. Um, different from that is the task of emotion detection, where um, the task is uh, given a uh, input uh, utterance to predict. Uh, so what is the emotion uh, connotated with that? And the interesting uh, part about uh, this specific. Um, uh, data set is that uh, in order to infer whether, for example, here um, this sentence uh, is connotated with joy or not, you sort of need to look at the whole um, a conversation history because the, it might be also sort of uh, meant sarcastically. But uh, I guess in this case, uh, Chandler is joyous because Ross sort of made a, a joke or something like that. Um, so um, we looked at um, a document level classification, where we sort of take a sentence or a document and just classify it in, in one of the um, existing categories. But uh, uh, we can do the same uh, at the level of words. So nothing prevents us uh, to uh, process the words one by one and uh, assign now uh, the categories to a uh, rather than a piece of text to a, a single word. So I'm sorry, this is a typo. Um, and the, something that you might uh, be familiar with um, uh, from the NLP uh, um, domain is the part of speech tagging. So for example, where, when, where we go uh, over a sentence word by word and uh, assign corresponding uh, part of speech. So for example, this here is a determiner and this is a noun, or as I mentioned earlier, named entity recognition. So the task of uh, assigning uh, or detecting sort of named entities in the uh, in a sentence. So uh, for the example, Victor Schlegel is a lecturer at the University of Manchester. 
um, the, 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 system, the train system would detect that uh, Victor Schlegel is an named entity and University of Manchester uh, is a named entity. So, um, and again, so let, let's, let's use this uh, to highlight um, the, the, uh, how, how neural networks operate differently from, uh, for example, rule-based approaches. Uh, so there is no dictionary that sort of mentions all sort of named entities and we look them up. Um, so, and it's not also highly unlikely that uh, Victor Schlegel here uh, appeared in some training data. So I don't think I appear in any of the training data used for uh, training named entity recognition uh, systems. Uh, it's just that uh, the system learned to infer what uh, what is and what isn't a named entity just uh, based on the uh, lexical surface form of the sentence. So, I mean, uh, for, for this one, it's probably uh, quite trivial because it's both um, names and uh, they're capitalized. But for example, I was a capitalized, uh, capitalized uh, lecturer here and uh, the system wouldn't detect it as a named entity correctly. So. And we can uh, go further and uh, see what other tasks we can sort of um, uh, model in this way. Where, uh, so for example, the task of open information extraction uh, is to extract some sort of a structured representation from unstructured text, which then can be used to, for example, populate uh, knowledge bases. So for, for this um, uh, sentence here, which is a, from a lyric, which you might be familiar with, um, if um, we sort of just go for each ver uh, verb that is detected in the sentence, we go token by token, detect whether the tokens uh, or the words sort of uh, are um, arguments to that predicate. So for, for the predicate walk or for the verb walk, the subject would be I, and then uh, there wouldn't be any object, but there would be a, a modal um, argument uh, that describes the direction. So, I mean, uh, it says, uh, uh, where do I walk? I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Similarly here uh, for the verb take, the argument would be, uh, uh, the, uh, so the, um, the subject would be I and the object, uh, uh, so the, what answered the question, uh, what did I take as a, a look at my life? So again, because nothing really prevents us to, um, uh, classify anything for the token, we might just as well go ahead and classify what is going to be the next token given the sequence of uh, previous tokens. And this task is known as language modeling. So uh, here, uh, given the sequence of um, uh, n uh, tokens uh, that we had before, what is the most likely uh, next token to appear? And this task is interesting uh, for the following reason. So in order to succeed at it, let's say um, we have the sentence, I grew up in Germany, I speak fluent, what's the next word? So in order to succeed at it and to predict the next word correctly, uh, you sort of need to have an understanding of uh, the syntax of the sentence. So if I say I grew up in Germany, I speak fluent swim, it doesn't make sense uh, just syntactically. So a verb just doesn't belong in that blank there. It should be probably a noun or maybe an adjective. And uh, again, in order to uh, make a, a prediction here that is not only uh, syntactically correct, but also semantically correct, you sort of need to uh, infer some semantic information from the sentence. So if I say I grew up in Germany, I speak fluent potato, it's syntactically correct, but it doesn't make any sense. Uh, similarly, if I say uh, it's rather unlikely to say I grew up in Germany, I speak fluent French. Um, so. Uh, uh, you know that this here should be some sort of language and uh, uh, most likely it's going to be German. And we can use this uh, formulation uh, to uh, train language models. Again, similar in the fashion uh, of, um, uh, of, of how we saw it uh, for the spam example. Here we just uh, classify token by token and we um, uh, sort of uh, maximize um, uh, or minimize the error between uh, any random token being predicted and the correct token being predicted. And the interesting thing here is that we don't really need a supervised uh, example. So we don't need to go around and label the data because we can sort of just take any sentence and remove any word. And this is going to be our training example. So we can you know, just go off uh, to Wikipedia and uh, sample a million sentences, remove uh, words and mask them and just uh, uh, try to predict them. And this is going to be our uh, data set. So this is what uh, we call self-supervision. Now, why am I talking about this? Uh, I'm talking about this because when we uh, uh, train this model and we're, we're, we're sort of done training it, we can just discard uh, this part here, which predicts the next token and use the distributional representation as the input to our um, 
uh, as, as input to our other uh, neural network based approaches the, uh, to produce the embedding. So, uh, and we, this is how we arrive at state of the art in NLP, in neural network based NLP is uh, the embeddings that we um, uh, used to produce the distributional representations um, are coming from a language model just like this, which has been trained on a, a large corpus such as the World Wide Web, um, uh, like the, the dump of Wikipedia or the common crawl of the World Wide Web. So again, because uh, nothing sort of uh, prevents us of uh, taking the token that we just produce as the um, uh, as the previous token and produce the next token based on that, uh, what we just produce, we can now uh, uh, generate a whole sequence of tokens. So for example, we can, uh, given the, uh, if we express our training data like this, given a string ABC and a special token that denotes the string is done, we can uh, train uh, our, our model uh, to predict uh, its translation to another uh, sequence such as W, X, Y, Z. So starting from the token that tells us, okay, this is the end of the sentence, we start predicting the first token, which we then use uh, as an input again to the, uh, to the next step to predict the next token and so on. So essentially what we're doing here is translation. So th this allows us to, uh, just by having uh, language one and language B uh, pairs, um, uh, denoted by the uh, separator token here uh, as our training set. This allows us to learn to translate uh, text from one uh, language to another. And because nothing constrains us to sort of use the same language, but uh, different uh, uh, semantic information, we can uh, use the sort of uh, monolingual trans uh, translation to uh, do all sort of uh, text generation, for example, uh, summarization. So if we take a uh, look at an example uh, here, uh, which is uh, a um, article uh, extracted from Wikihow, we can make use of the fact that uh, the steps here sort of are summarized first with a, with a quick sentence and then expanded upon with a longer explanation. And if we take the uh, summarized uh, uh, sentences in bold and it, it take this as our summary and the long explanations uh, as sort of the whole article, we can, um, we can generate our own uh, summarization data set where the goal is given this uh, long uh, sentence to generate sort of uh, this summary. Um, uh, similarly, we can use, for example, abstracts uh, from papers or abstracts for, uh, from uh, news articles. Right, so uh, that was a very uh, brief look uh, at how we can model uh, different tasks um, in natural language processing. So um, the, I, I, I kept it brief and I sort of omitted a couple of details. So, um, but uh, for you to get the idea how, um, uh, how, how um, uh, this is being done uh, in, uh, nowadays. And now we move away from, from this uh, more towards, so what I've been doing um, in this area and uh, what I've been doing is I've been looking at how to uh, sort of, uh, how do we look at um, uh, evaluating uh, the performance of this neural network based approaches and how do we establish um, sort of um, different, uh, um, uh, different, different properties of these neural networks. So um, I will um, talk about machine reading comprehension which is um, uh, the topic I've been focusing on uh, in my research. And uh, uh, the, the fact is, so, so many of the things that I'm going to mention uh, is uh, they're sort of, um, they can be transferred to the other tasks which I've been uh, talking about before as well to varying degree. So what is machine reading comprehension? Um, so when you learned uh, a new language, um, sort of in order to establish that uh, when you uh, that that you uh, understand the the, the language, uh, uh, you would uh, sort of do a read a reading comprehension test where you get a, a, a piece of text and then you would need to read through it and then you sort of need to answer some questions about it. So similarly, machine reading comprehension uh, does the same, but uh, it's not not for you, but for a computer. So uh, here, uh, the task is given a passage, which is some sort of game summary of a uh, NHL game, NFL game, sorry, uh, football, yeah, not, not hockey, so, so, which is the summary of an, an NFL game. 
Uh, and then uh, there, there would be some sort of questions um, asked about that passage and uh, the, the task for the for, for the neural network or for the uh, machine for the for the machine reading convention system is to predict the answer so if it could be for example multiple choice or fill in the gap or sort of just generate an answer um, uh, whatever it is but in fact uh, what i've been mostly focusing on is the type of answer that you can find by highlighting uh, the, uh, what answers the uh, question most in the passage. So here, what was the final score of the game would be 27 to four is explicitly mentioned in the passage. So uh, why is uh, question answering uh, an interesting task or so is a machine reading comprehension? And uh, so one might argue that machine reading comprehension or question answering can be used as an interface to um, general linguistic artificial intelligence, which sounds like something uh, Skynet would talk about, but uh, it, it, so it, what this basically means is that uh, we can use it as a human computer interface to uh, data and knowledge exploration. So let's say um, for someone who is a non-computer scientist, it's probably quite hard to understand what this one means. And if you want to, you know, uh, go ahead and explore some uh, relational database, you'd rather um, ask it in your natural language. So uh, basically these two things are equivalent, but this one is uh, more intuitive to formulate and more intuitive to ask. So it would engage more people to uh, explore uh, some sort of knowledge. Similarly, if you use information tree, well, you don't have to fiddle around with keywords anymore. You uh, sort of just ask away. So you don't need to think about, okay, so is this keyword going to uh, make the search results worse or better? And similarly, uh, it can be used as an interface to other tasks that we looked uh, before. And as an example, let's take uh, the information extraction example. So uh, basically, uh, rather than going uh, token by token and labeling token by token, uh, whether it belongs to a relation uh, as an argument or as, or as a predicate or not, we can just start with, okay, so what is being done? So basically we ask for the verb and it is walk, and we can use that to infer further information. So who walks through the valley? So we ask for the subject and it's I. And then uh, where do I walk this, uh, to, to get the uh, modal argument here for the direction? So uh, in a way we can sort of, rather than having multiple different tasks, we can uh, with multiple different models, we can just have one task with um, uh, one approach. So it's a sort of a, a standardization interface. It can be regarded as that. So, um, and just as about any other task, which I was talking about, uh, the state of the art for machine reading comprehension um, is dominated by a language model based approaches, which embed passages and questions uh, into a high dimensional uh, vector space to obtain a contextualized distributional representation. And these language models, again, are trained on a large background corpus. And then uh, uh, they, they're also trained on task specific data set to opt uh, optimize the uh, weights to minimize the error between the um, produced predictions and the actual answers. So, one problem uh, that we uh, have seen uh, as, uh, when I explained what neural networks are on a high level is that they're basically just something, uh, just matrices that multiply numbers with other numbers. So just by looking at those numbers, and we're talking about uh, 1024 dimensions, uh, uh, 1024 dimensional vectors of numbers, we cannot really infer what uh, is going on there. So just looking at, at the neural network and uh, sort of at the matrices, we don't really know what they're doing. So in order to understand um, their behavior and whether or not they sort of succeed at the task, what we do is uh, we do black box testing. So we leave the net a black box neural network as it is, and we, we concentrate on the, the inputs we feed into it and the outputs that they produce. And uh, the way it is done typically is we collect a, um, a data set uh, of questions, passages, and answers. And we split it uh, randomly, and we use one part of that uh, data set to train the neural network uh, based uh, question answering or into reading comprehension system. And uh, we use the remaining, remaining set to sort of evaluate the performance, similarly to the spam example with the gold standard, right? So, because uh, as we can see here, it requires around 100,000 examples. Um, it would be actually quite an achievement if you managed to collect 100,000 questions, passages, and answers, and still uh, publish a paper that is relevant because you, it would probably take you 20 years. So what is typically done uh, is that uh, this uh, process is crowdsourced where um, uh, we um, sort of uh, write a set of instructions uh, to crowd workers, which we pay to collect the questions and answers for us. Now, um, 
So what happens is we sort of give away the control of, of the approach. So we don't really know what the neural network is doing. And we also give away the control over the data which we use to train the approach because it's collected by crowd workers. Sure, they follow some sort of instructions, but they're not necessarily um, uh, they're done, right? So, so there's a lot of variability there. So again, and because it, it would be impressive to go over 100,000 examples uh, to classify all of them in order to see what, uh, what they sort of expose. Um, we end up with the situation that we don't really know what these uh, neural networks learn because we don't really know how, uh, how they operate and we don't really know what they are optimized on. And that means so we don't really know what our gold standards, which are again collected uh, using uh, crowd uh, sourcing, uh, which uh, reading comprehension capabilities they evaluate and which they don't evaluate. And if we don't know uh, what we evaluate or not evaluate, we uh, cannot really say which uh, reading comprehension capabilities these uh, neural network models uh, acquire or not acquire. So, um, that that, uh, that leads us, and here uh, with us, I refer to uh, me uh, in my research, whereas before us, I was referring to uh, NLP researchers in general. So that leads us to take a systematic look into the data which we use to uh, evaluate uh, uh, these uh, models. And they say that no uh, presentation is complete without a cluttered slide full of results. So here we go, let's get that out of the way and focus your attention on basically what's missing. So what do these gold standards not evaluate? And what they don't evaluate are sort of challenging examples uh, which uh, expose or which um, uh, contain linguistic features like restrictivity. So if I have a sentence like almost, it would mean, uh, or if I have a word like almost, it would make the sentence mean a completely different thing than uh, if it was not there. So uh, if Brady almost scored a touchdown, uh, it's sort of exactly the opposite of Brady scored a touchdown. And um, similarly, so with effectivity, uh, there, there's a clear difference between a state uh, a fact stated uh, tentatively, like probably, whereas uh, 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 if it's stated definitely. And uh, what's also missing is um, uh, some mentions of discourse relations, such as conditionals and conjunctions. And in fact, for, for the latter um, um, uh, category, we managed uh, to show that uh, this can also be um, uh, since the presence of, of this uh, discourse relations for some of them can be uh, automated, so we can evaluate a, a gold standard with quantitative measures whether it uh, contains any of these features. Whereas for 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 our analysis here, we actually went into the data and looked uh, into it manually, so we labeled the subsample. And uh, to make a long story the long story short, how, how are they all uh, similar to each other? So what's missing is um, if a phenomena or linguistic features that preserve the lexical surface uh, form of a sentence while altering its meaning. So, and if we uh, don't uh, evaluate uh, systems on this sort of uh, phenomena, we don't know if they learn to process them. And so what I highlighted here in orange sounds very fancy, but what it basically means um, is uh, uh, things that uh, look similar, but mean different things. So uh, just as, as uh, this, uh, example here, so almost, and uh, so Brady almost skirted the D and Brady skirted the D is very similar. And we're going to come back to that example a couple of slides later. So uh, we were, of course, not the only ones to uh, realize that. So um, the other researchers found uh, the lack of sort of this uh, capabilities in evaluation data or in, or in training data as well. And uh, this led to a spur of sort of um, skill specific uh, instructions for the crowd workers, where the goal is not to just collect any questions and uh, uh, answers, but to collect questions and answers that are um, that, that in order to be solved correctly require a specific skill. So if we look at the uh, papers that have been published uh, uh, describing the resources uh, with, with that regard, so we see keywords like discrete reasoning. So that would uh, involve some sort of arithmetic um, uh, computation in order to uh, arrive at the correct answer. Or here, uh, multi-hop reasoning uh, or question answer in which sort of denotes that uh, in order to answer the question, you need to uh, collect it from different pieces uh, of information or multiple uh, documents even. Or here, uh, logical reasoning, where it would imply that you sort of need to perform some sort of logical reasoning in order to answer the question correctly. So, and what happened then is the fact that 
uh, this uh, neural network based uh, language model uh, based uh, machine reading comprehension approaches they managed to outperform uh, or managed to perform really well on this um, uh, on this uh, data sets as well so even outperforming humans in some of the cases which sort of the, the you know the hypes everything up so wow uh, we, we get uh, neural networks which can read better than humans so you just, uh, go ahead and sort of start using it for your purposes and then you get a situation like this where and you have the passage, um, I have an apple, and then you have a question, so how many apples do I have? And then the explanation here is, well, the model decided it was a counting problem, uh, and the answer is two, which is, of course, not, not correct, because uh, you have an apple, and this is something that is not uh, 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 that a human would answer. So a human would probably rather answer, okay, I don't care, or whatever, uh, or, or it's one apple, but certainly not two. Um, which, again, made us uh, go, go, go and look uh, sort of in the... Um, literature uh, about uh, what kind of these uh, issues that I described here uh, intuitively have been reported systematically. And what we arrived at is uh, the following situation. So to exemplify, um, if we look at this uh, example that would need sort of a complicated um, and type of reasoning where uh, you know you need to uh, combine two passages and sort of perform some sort of a geospatial resolution. Um, in order to arrive at the answer. But if you look more closely, uh, if you just read the first five tokens, so what is the, the 2010 population of, of the city, uh, uh, and you look at the answer sentence, you see that 2010 only appears uh, 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 right next to the um, uh, expected answer. So you don't really need to read any other passages. So you sort of have uh, collocations between a question and answer, which lead to some unwanted cues. and. Um, because uh, the way we formulate the task, so we want the model to uh, learn just from input and output examples, if the skews are prevalent in the data, these uh, neural networks learn to rely on the strongest signal in the data. So they pay attention uh, to the surface form if, it's, if that's what is the strongest signal. And then rather than performing like complicated reasoning, what they perform is some sort of sophisticated word matching. And the worst yet of all is that it goes undetected with the usual evaluation methodology where we split the collected data set randomly into training and evaluation. Because uh, if we have some cues that are present in the data set, they would be present in the training set and the neural network would learn to exploit them. And they would also be present in the evaluation set. So the neural network would also uh, perform reasonably well and obtain a high score in the evaluation set just because they sort of stem from the same uh, generative process. So. Uh, we, what, what that means is we still don't really know what these systems learn, even if we have this skill-based uh, uh, data sets. So all we can say is uh, that uh, this neural network learned to succeed at this data set, not necessarily at the task that the data set represents. Now, uh, this is not necessarily a bad thing. If we have um, uh, something where the data set represents the task perfectly, for example, as in chess, and the task is to outperform the humans consistently, and the data set is to um, is a sort of uh, uh, simulate a million of uh, games, then you have a data that is uh, sort of representative of the task. And then uh, they, uh, the, the, the computers actually learn to outperform the humans consistently. Um, and you don't want to all of a sudden have them uh, play, I don't know, Go uh, after having been trained to play a chess. But in natural language, where we have what is so-called a uh, long tail distribution of um, phenomena, so where there is a lot of uh, variation in the uh, language, we, we cannot really uh, go and have a finite size data set that captures all of this long tail distribution. So inevitably, we're going to have something that's not represented in the data. So uh, this leads to a different way of uh, viewing uh, the skill-based uh, evaluation, and th that is by uh, using challenge sets. So rather than uh, um, training on the same uh, uh, data set that was used to, or rather than evaluating on the same data set that was used to train uh, the model, we perform some what we call uh, out of distribution evaluation. So where we uh, collect a, um, a challenge set of the, of examples that require that skill to uh, solve these examples uh, from a different uh, process. So we can either handcraft them ourselves. So that's what require expert knowledge or we can generate them automatically. And that's what in fact, what we did in the, uh, in the paper that I'm going to talk uh, next. And then we evaluate uh, some optimized uh, MRC system that was optimized on some training set, uh, which was generated differently than the, the challenge set uh, on those examples. And if we get a good performance, we can sort of say, well, okay, the, 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 the system sort of uh, learned to perform it. 
But if we get a bad performance, we sort of need to discount between the general uh, in or, or the general capability of uh, being trained on some sort of data and being evaluated on some different sort of data, and the capability to perform uh, the actual skill. So uh, this is something that is called the mind shift. And so, for example, if you want to see uh, if someone can run, you don't ask him ask them to run sort of against the wind so because running against the wind is harder than just running so you would sort of want to um, disentangle the, the capability of running and running against a strong wind right so similarly here we want to disentangle the capability of um, uh, transferring the knowledge uh, from the training set to a, a different uh, evaluation data and the capability to perform the task that we're interested in so uh, an example for, for, for a skill that we, we were looking uh, to evaluate is semantic altering modifications. So if we have a passage like this here, even if it sort of requires uh, some sort of um, uh, arithmetic reasoning, so what is the longest touchdown run? If you get a lot of examples like this, at some point you will just infer, okay, so let's just look at the numbers next to touchdown and pick the highest, and you will perform reasonably well if the example only looked like that. Whereas if you insert a, a sort of a semantic altering modification, such as almost, um, uh, this uh, uh, heuristic won't work anymore. So therefore, um, uh, we argue that sort of uh, if, if MRC models uh, can uh, uh, process the semantic altering modifications, they um, uh, or, or in order to process this sort of semantic altering modifications, they require some sort of deeper uh, reading comprehension capability beyond just the lexical exploitation of uh, the exploitation of lexical cues, uh, such as it would be a case with these examples. And because we don't only just insert almost in a couple of sentences, um, we collect um, examples that are sort of uh, semantically uh, similar. So it, it is a fairly closed um, uh, group of um, uh, things like uh, polarity reversing uh, verbs and uh, also explicit negation, for example. And then we go ahead and ask, so can uh, the existing uh, state-of-the-art machine reading comprehension system uh, process these examples? And again, another slide which is full of, ex uh, full of results, but let's focus on the overall message here. And the answer is, well, no, not really. So uh, even after discounting for all the, uh, you know, confounding factors of uh, being evaluated on different data than it was trained on, we still arrived at the accuracy is around 20% uh, for, for, for this state of the art models. And um, if, for evaluating um, uh, the semantic altering modification. So um, uh, while we focused on, uh, on this phenomenon, um, uh, the methodology can be used also to uh, infer uh, whether some other uh, phenomena are being processed correctly, for example, here, data filtration. And we're talking here about uh, models that are so sort of used in production. So this one is here, 11.5 gigabytes, the uh, uh, size of model, which is um, essentially a lot of parameters. And even if, uh, even if a large model trained on a very large data set can't uh, perform that, then neither uh, can arguably the, the, the smaller ones. So what that means is that we still even after doing all of that, we still still don't really know what these models learn. So all we can say that uh, these models didn't learn a skill X. So even because even if we get a model that performs reasonably well of our, on our constructed challenge set, um, again, we get the long uh, tail uh, distribution phenomenon. So uh, uh, who says that our challenge set actually comprehensively represents all possible ways of representing that phenomenon? So even if we get a good performance, we sort of really don't exactly know what these models learned. So you can sort of either go crazy about it or you can accept the fact that this is how uh, empirical research uh, and uh, the scientific method works and sort of carry on and try to find a more challenging uh, challenge set once you have challenge sets that, uh, or once you have models that uh, success uh, succeed at, the, at this challenge set. Right, so this was an excurse at what uh, I've been doing in my research. And now let's uh, try to tie that back into what is the more general issues going around with neural network research uh, or neural network based natural language research. So one thing is that you get uh, uh, diminishing returns. So what that means is we have uh, natural language processing um, the progress is, is basically driven by the size of the model and data. So the more mod, uh, the, the more data you use to train and the bigger you have the models, um, the, the better the performance you get, which we see here. But uh, bigger models also require more compute. And in fact, uh, in order to drive the progress, you need um, exponentially more uh, uh, computational uh, steps. 
So that means, uh, so this appears here linear, but in fact, the, the, the scalar logarithmic set means uh, the, the correlation is sort of exponential. So it means that it uh, forms a participation barrier for uh, researchers that do not have the means to um, uh, employ uh, or to spend a lot of money sort of to gain access to this cloud-based services or to have, uh, you know, deep learning based servers. So, and if you're not uh, uh, being uh, represented in the training data because you don't participate, then you, uh, then the data-driven solution won't work for you. So uh, you might have heard about the uh, face recognition system that is, um, uh, that was trained on a non-diverse data set and it would have then issues to recognize um, faces of uh, people of color or to go back to um, NLP example, if we train our NLP systems only trained on standard English spoken in the US or the UK uh, and uh, uh, we, we know that it can answer uh, questions correctly, then when we sort of um, uh, uh, use uh, non-standardized English, so if there are, for example, typos or, or some English uh, variants uh, spoken, for example, uh, in Singapore, then all of a sudden the model will not be able to answer our questions correctly. And uh, this sort of questions the whole HCI interface uh, uh, to knowledge exploration perspective. But even uh, if uh, you, you are represented in the data, this is a, what, what we have uh, probably seen so far is that neural networks uh, excel at explaining statistical patterns in data. And there exists no device to distinguish between whether these uh, patterns are spurious or actually robust. And uh, the hope is even uh, as we get more training data, uh, the robust correlations will dominate over the spurious, spurious ones. But uh, it's not necessarily the reality because, uh, for example, if we have an example like this, so the nurse notified that the patient, uh, the, notified the patient that his shift would be ending an hour, and the nurse notified the patient that her shift would be ending an hour. If we need to uh, resolve, so who is his uh, referring to? If we just go by majority, then uh, the, the neural networks will struggle to refer to the nurse because nurse is something that is uh, connotated with, the, uh, with females. Uh, whereas patient is something that is more uh, neutral. So in this case, um, uh, semantically, it doesn't make sense to resolve his to the patient because it doesn't make sense. Why would a patient have a shift, right? The nurse has a shift, even if uh, a nurse is male in this case. So which leads to the research area of um, uh, devising this representation. So here, if we uh, take an example, uh, take a look at an example of man and woman. So man is somehow uh, in the vector space closer uh, to technology and science, whereas woman is closer to uh, literature and family. The goal is to sort of disentangle these representations in a way that uh, these um, man and woman uh, vectors are equidistant to all of the things mentioned before, so science and technology and art and literature. So uh, in case you're interested, there's uh, a nice survey uh, on bias and fairness in machine learning mentioning also the debiasing techniques uh, here. And finally, so this also might be interesting for you actually. So what happens if we don't have any data? So we already saw language models and neural networks work so well exactly because there is a lot of data to learn a, a rich representation. So what happens if you don't have uh, data uh, for, for a task? So uh, research in the direction of future or transfer learning uh, sort of looks at how to uh, learn something from as little examples as possible. Whereas uh, if you don't have um, examples for, for a whole language rather than a task, uh, you can learn um, cross-lingual representations. And this is something that is interestingly done by um, researchers at Facebook. So uh, these language models, nothing sort of confines us to train them on a single language only. We can uh, collect the data set of multiple languages and learn sort of language agnostic representations. That's something that uh, uh, Professor Komsky would probably like. Um, and then if we combine those both directions, and uh, this is again, something that sounds like from a, a sci-fi movie, cross-lingual few shot learning. What that means is sort of we um, learn, uh, an agno uh, learn multiple language agnostic representations, and then we select from those that, that, that best generalize to a new language, which uh, wasn't observed uh, during the training. And so to conclude what I've been talking about, We've seen how to, uh, on a very high level, how we can use neural networks uh, to model various NLP tasks end to end. And we saw that uh, we can, uh, the neural networks can in fact learn to perform tasks uh, based on input output uh, examples, if there's enough input and output examples. So, um, 
And many of those tasks can be modeled uh, as input as out and output examples, as we have seen. And uh, uh, progress in NLP is basically driven by uh, more training data and uh, a bigger uh, uh, neural networks and, and bigger models. So uh, we have seen that neural networks excel at inferring statistical patterns from training data. And they achieve superb performances if the task is well represented in terms of the statistical patterns. So for example, this is, this is the case in chess, but uh, also in natural language processing. So if, if you can represent the task by, uh, by the training data fairly well, for example, this is the case for uh, post tagging or uh, named entity recognition, and we will have a, a off-the-shelf approach which works reasonably well. But if we have um, uh, uh, an application that differs from the training data, we get unpredictable performance. And in order to sort of have a look into this unpredictable performance, we can um, ha have a look at, um, at the finer grained levels. We can um, infer which linguistic capabilities uh, uh, these uh, models uh, learn. And we can use uh, task specific data and, uh, um, that requires these capabilities in order to um, establish the performance of this capability. And uh, finally, so uh, we've seen that deep learning has uh, uh, impact beyond uh, the scientific community. So uh, it has a high participation barrier and which can lead to underrepresentation. And uh, bias already presented in training data can then be exacerbated. So that's been it from my side. And uh, I'm open to any questions. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. I think there was a lot of information uh, contained. <laughs> uh, I, I do see one question from Taya. So I would be interested to know what size corpus is needed for embeddings. So this was already asked quite early in the presentation. Um, so what size corpus is needed for embeddings, given that in the South African context, we usually have little data. So, um, right, so um, that um that depends so if i start with what is being used now they don't uh so, so by now they measure the the text uh, rather than in in the number of words they measure the text in uh, gigabytes or uh, uh, terabytes of text right so the uh, to put uh, to put long uh, things short a lot but can also um, so to put to put uh, um, a, a specific numbers, so for example, uh, word to vec uh, uh, which is one of the first neural network based embedding approaches, was trained on um, six billion tokens, similarly to GLOF, uh, which went up from six billions to up to eight hundred forty billions of tokens. So that being said, you can also use, um, as I said, so it doesn't have to be neural networks in order to train uh, similarity. Um, uh, based uh, embeddings. You can also use more traditional methods such as uh, term frequency or lat latent uh, semantic analysis, which uh, will also learn, uh, which will also work from a smaller corpora. Okay, and thanks. So that uh, answers the question. Yeah, so I, th I think what you're saying is that we, we should just try, right? So there are different techniques that we can use. Um, so do you know if there's any information on, uh, so you showed some graphs where you, where you could see that the growth, the, the performance was uh, essentially, um, uh, no, so that the, the amount of data needed is exponential to get linear growth. Um, so we're say in the, in the left side of the graph then. Um, sorry, so do you mean this one? Uh, yeah, so this is about the computation and the performance, mm -hmm. but I think it's it's similar to the use of data, right? The uh, yes, available yes. Data. So yeah. um, there is a nice study um, uh, that uh, sort of formalizes this, or, or that there's an empirical study on uh, how, uh, the the size of the um, uh, the size of the model and the, the size of the training data, which is one of them is this one. And the other one I, um, by, by the authors that introduced the T5 transformer, I can uh, search it out for you and uh, put it in the chat. So they sort of systematically increase the size of the training corpus and observe the performance on the, some of the representative natural language processing tasks. 
Okay, thanks. I, I just realized it's already a little bit past 11, so I do understand if people need to leave. Uh, so this was really for an hour. You're also welcome to stay for a bit and, and ask more questions. So there's one question that I have. I don't see anything on the chat. Um, so you showed a lot of potential uh, applications for, um, for neural nets. Um, so if we want to start with this, or if some one of us would want to start with this, where, where do we go? What is the, the easy introduction? You said you can use existing uh, software to do a lot of the uh, difficult computation for you. Where, where do we start? So <laughs> I, I guess uh, I, I would start with something uh, where you already have the data available. So I, I don't think it would help to start so if you want to sort of learn how neural networks work, I would recommend with starting some of the standardized data sets, for example, question answering. So um, there exist sort of things which you just um, run and they work because the data is already nicely pre-processed. You don't need to uh, process that because the way, the way you pre-process data is sort of different from how neural networks work. Neural networks are transparent. You can use the same architecture to train on uh, you know, text or uh, on images. Um, and uh, you, you know they, they would still work. So they, they infer the information from the data. So uh, I guess in order to start, if, 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 if one's interested in learning how neural networks work and then trying to apply them to, um, uh, to, to uh, the, uh, their own language, I'd probably start with learning how neural networks work uh, on another language and then see how um, any of the things mentioned um, here uh, can be uh, used in order to sort of approach the language with uh, a low to uh, little resources. So I, I would say probably go on and start with uh, some of the uh, natural language uh, processing uh, tutorials available, for example, at the uh, PyTorch website, which uh, uh, present like this is so which sort of explain how what I was just talking about, so it works, which sort of explain how it works. So rather than knowing that uh, it's uh, that things like that are in principle possible, you also know how to in fact implement them. And then I would uh, probably go on and try to um, uh, make use of of some of those uh, cross-lingual um, language models, uh, and then uh, to go ahead and sort of start collecting your own data sets. And this is. Well, this is something that then basically needs a lot of experimentation. So some things that can also help us, um, in fact, to perform data augmentation. So before you have no data at all, you might also generate uh, your data um, uh, sort of syntactically, uh, uh, synthetically. So if we take a look at, uh, let me find this uh, slide. If we take a look at this example, so um, the, the, the researchers here found that uh, the model is sort of um, uh, not really recognizing uh, spelling errors, which uh, for the standard English are spelling errors, but for other types of English, they're normal. So what they did is they augmented the training data with all sort of sorts of perturbations, which uh, make sense grammatically. And then, uh, and then uh, they, they retrain the model and then uh, it would uh, re recognize the sentences and uh, predict correctly. So uh, I could imagine you could do similarly in order to just, to just get some data going is you can sort of uh, generate the data uh, or some parts of the data syntactically to augment your data set. Uh, that was like sort of a lengthy explanation. I hope it, it, it hinted at what you wanted to know. Yeah, I think um, that that was very useful. So you mentioned PyTor PyTorch. Uh, I put the link in the in the chat. I hope I found the yeah the that's right the link. One. Yeah, okay. So that's just for people interested in actually trying this. Uh, are there any other questions? I don't see any other questions on the chat. I mean, I, I still have a lot of questions, but I think we, we should take that offline as well. Okay, yeah, I, I mean, I sort of apologize a bit for running over, as, as I said, I, it's probably the first time I present that early. So I guess yesterday I was just a bit faster when, when practicing it. So which leads <laughs> me to think that I, I guess it was not enough coffee in this morning. Right. <laughs> it's slower than usual. 
Yeah. Okay. No. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed your your presentation. Like I said, there was a lot of a lot of information in there. Um, I will ask you for this slide. I mean, I have already asked you for the slides. Uh, I, I hope that you you're willing to send them so we can share them uh, on our website as well, just as the video, so people can still go back to the slides and the information in there um, to uh, yeah to to learn more from this. So I'd very much like to thank you for for your presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity, and I will uh, send you over the slides once I fix the typo. Okay, okay wonderful. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for the questions. Um, all right, I will just stop, and I guess I'll leave. Goodbye, everyone. Have a nice day.